Welcome to Chats with the Chief. I'm John Jensen, Chief of Staff at the Veterans Health Administration, and this is the podcast where we make small talk about the largest integrated healthcare system in the country. This week, I'm joined by Dr. Richard Stone, Executive in Charge of the Veterans Health Administration. We will talk about challenging the status quo of government bureaucracy and empowering and sustaining VHA's people during the last mile of the pandemic. Enjoy the show. Sir, thank you so much for being here. I was saying and before we began that uh, I think the word is giddy, and, and I'm giddy that I have the opportunity to be able to interview my boss, and I don't, lot of, lots of other people that have that opportunity to be able to interview their boss. And so welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. It's going to be a lot of fun, and sure appreciate to hear so many great things from you about what's been happening in BHA and, and, and to learn more about you as well. Well, John, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, you and I have known each other a long time, and um, I have considered this, and you say I'm interviewing my boss. Uh, we've been friends for a long time, and uh, I appreciate the partnership that we've had over these years, and especially over this tough year that we've had uh, work on this pandemic. So it's been great. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I, I just am just really happy to be able to share uh, with our audience, our employees, uh, what it is that, you know, how we do things, but also for them to hear more about you and kind of your leadership philosophy and how things have, you know, kind of gone, not only during the pandemic, but before that, and then what's, what's to happen in the future. But maybe share something about your family or something that people, people might not know about you. I'm a dad, uh, I'm a husband. I, um, we've been married for a little over 24 years. Uh, my wife and I met uh, in the military. I was, uh, what people may not know about me is uh, Jenny was uh, a, a critical care nurse in the Army and uh, the Army in typical fashion on utilization of skill sets decided to make her a five-ton truck driver. <laughs> and uh, she was driving a truck. I was running and a uh, team that was teaching people how to survive convoys. And uh, we began interacting as part of the fact that her five-ton truck uh, sunk in uh, about six feet deep of mud, and we had to pull it out. Uh, she was not a terribly happy person, but that's how we met. <laughs> and we ended up uh, married now uh, nearly a quarter of a century later, and um, two children, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been fun. Going back to the question you ask, uh, you know, if you ask me, you know, what are the what are my hobby? It's to be with my family as much as I can, and we camp and we walk and we uh, we bicycle and we do all sorts of things. But it's uh, it's really family activities when I'm not working. Yeah, and I know that you're working a lot, specifically during COVID, and uh, it's it's always been amazing. I, I want to tell just a quick story. So right when you came into the executive in charge role. Um, you, you were uh, leading a meeting uh, about some OMI reports, actually, if I remember correctly. And it was interesting to everybody around the room that you knew exactly what was in those reports, where you had done your homework beforehand. So your example of preparedness has <laughs> it's resonated throughout the system. And actually, it was a great learning event for me to be able to see that, you know, the leader needs to be prepared for what the discussions are because you need to lead the discussions and come to decisions. You know, John, I, I decided a long time ago that people's time is precious and we shouldn't spend time reviewing slides or documents to, to bring me up to speed to make a decision. If you want a decision from me, I ought to do my work in advance. So it, usually in the evening I read. Yep. And uh, there's not very much on television that interests me. And so I, I read, you know, while the family watches TV or do whatever conversation's going on. And, and it, it, it does surprise people when they come into the room and I say, look, you're looking for a decision. This makes sense to me. Um, is there anything in the documents you gave to me that you wish you to put in? And then there's always a minute or two of right. discussion. But then we're ready to make a decision. We can, you know, something may be scheduled for 30 minutes. We can get it done in five and uh, then give people time back to their day to work. Well, I think everybody really appreciates, but it's also, again, it's a very, it's a good leadership lesson for everyone to be able to utilize to, to get to decisions. And you led into really what my next question is, and so we typically have some questions just to kind of get things flowing, but also really to learn a little bit more about you. And you talked about reading and books, and I know they're very important to you. And um, throughout, throughout your time here, I mean, we've kind of had a, a book club uh, of leadership here and uh, have, have offered several books. Um, Talking to Strangers is one that comes to mind. So what, what are you reading right now that people would be interested in that, that you can share a little bit about? So what I just finished, um, my second read of is a book called Deaths of Despair 
and that'll ruin your your viewership right away as I as I say that title. Uh, Deaths of Despair is written by two uh, economists from Princeton, and it it highlights uh, suicide, alcohol-induced liver disease causing death, and drug overdose as three types of deaths. Uh, that have resulted in extraordinary change in the lifespan of Americans. And um, what it does, what this book does is, is traces back over 50 years what's happening and what has happened to, um, to Americans, especially blue collar workers in America. And this sort of stagnation of wages that has resulted in hopelessness, the movement of manufacturing jobs overseas. And what's resulted in a lot of the schism in America that has occurred today. And uh, when you read it, I, it's not a happy book. Mm -hmm. But I began reading it as part of we were getting ready to release our suicide numbers. And um, I thought that veteran suicide was a broader discussion than what we were having. And, and so you and I have talked about this book a yep. lot. You've yep. read it. I have. Um, I've been through it now twice, once on audio and once... Um, in hard copy and there's some really important lessons to this and that apply to what's happening in all of America and as the debate goes on in these next year over what what's going to be the federal minimum wage uh, all is part of that book of sort of what is the future where is hope you know I graduated from high school in a time when half of I grew up in southeastern Michigan and a half of my high school class went directly to the auto plants at age 18. Uh, about 40% went directly to the military because it was the Vietnam era. And uh, about 10% of us went on to college. And um, the 50% that went to the auto plants were an aristocracy of the, of the blue collar right. worker. They had great wages. They raised their families. They had two homes, one in northern Michigan on a lake, one in the southern part of the state where the auto plants were. Uh, they had snowmobiles. They, right. they had a good life. They sent their kids to college. I think uh, what we, one of the things we have to do is, is really think about, ha is that dream still present for the blue collar worker? Is that dream still present for the technical worker, non-college graduate? And what this book does is really begin to articulate that. I think it's an important dialogue. And uh, it's a dialogue that will be necessary um, if we're ever going to heal this nation in the way we should. Yeah, and I, and I think even back to the veteran side, that there's so many similarities to, to veterans and those that have left service after three years or even get to retirement age and be able to leave. You still get into that social economic uh, piece that's very similar to the way the book is described. Even though it's not focused on the veteran community, there are a lot of similarities. And if you get into despair, I mean, it happens through many different ways, but you know, economic is one that you definitely can find out in this book. And so it's a great book. And I took, I read it on your recommendation. And uh, again, part of the Dr. Stone book club has been, it's been very insightful, but also I think what really shows, and maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, continual learning. What, what does that mean? And how, how does, how should others look at that? Well, uh, look, there's a, I have, with my medical degree and then my military advanced uh, strategy training. I have three college degrees. Um, they were a long time ago. Almost none of that knowledge that I learned at that time really is applicable today. But it is a bedrock and a foundation upon which I built. But I, I'm a big believer in continual learning. Uh, I'm a believer that organizations have to continually learn. It's one of the things that's the pillar of that we've done uh, in the more than two and a half years that I've been in this position is try and create venues where individuals learn from each other. You've heard me talking. We've talked about high reliability culture and deference to expertise. Right. We have created venues. In fact, most of our day is spent in various venues in which we're learning from other individuals right. or giving a vision leader or a medical center director a chance to say, look, I've tried to solve this problem this way. I think I've got this. And then creating venues that allow 174 medical center directors to learn very quickly and not wait for a directive from the senior executive but to really get out. In fact, it's one of the things we've done in the COVID pandemic is, you know, we operated under the principle of uh, 
of save every life you can. There's no part of save every life you can that is that defers to bureaucracy. Right. That's right. You've got to bypass the bureaucracy. Let the bureaucracy catch up to you. Right. That can be uncomfortable for a, a pretty bureaucratic organization. It can be really uncomfortable. We established a goal early in the pandemic of we ought to be able to hire people within three days because everybody's going to want to hire health care workers in the nation during this pandemic. And uh, a very substantial portion of the hires that we've done uh, now, more than 70,000 hires that we've done have been done within a 72-hour period. We were at 100 days before this. Started. Unheard of <laughs> now, to get to that you point. Know, there's people that sort of are entrenched in the bureaucracy that will feel uncomfortable with that and um, that we're sort of bypassing the bureaucracy. And we'll come back to it, and you'll hear some turbulence. Uh, I, very little of that turbulence means very much to me. Uh, my view is get to what is right, do what is right, defer to experts that will help you learn. Right. And your question was, you know, how do I learn? I, I learn from everybody around me. And if you ask me, gee, what's your, um, your leadership philosophy? Uh, recognize the fact that in big organizations, uh, my job is to create the environment that allows right. people to really express every bit of their talent and, and protect them in that process, that they can take risk. You can fail. Now, you can't be criminal, you can't be negligent, you can't be reckless in what you're doing. But what you can be uh, is you can take risk and try and get to the, to the right place we're trying to get to. And it's, it's, it, it, it's shown in this organization an ability to really respond in this pandemic tremendously. And you have to be very proud of the 364,000 employees that uh, work here and how they've handled this. It's amazing what it, they've done. It really truly is and this is why this is this type of venue is so important for employees to not only hear from you but to hear about how things led to our response but also to hear how their leaders, their direct leaders, their medical center directors are are given the venues and the avenues to be in order to make decisions and many times they come to us with you know great ideas that we just get out of their way and provide Try to provide support to them to be able to, to make decisions as well as be successful. And we're going to, we're seeing that right now in the vaccine, actually. Yeah, we we are. Uh, you know, um, we were just looking at some numbers yesterday. In the last 24 hours, America has given to all Americans 293,000 um, vaccine doses. Um, over 27,000 of those were given by the VA. That's extraordinary. That, that about 10% of the vaccine being given is given by the VA. And over the last 24 hours, in fact, all night, we were getting ideas being sent up yep. of, gee, I think we can accelerate this process. I think we'll end up giving well over 100,000 vaccine doses a day. Um, and I think you're gonna see it occurring seven days a week. And uh, I think you'll see us not only doing our veterans, but we have already accepted the mission of taking on some other federal agencies, in, including Homeland Security, to, to get their people done. And um, I think you'll begin to see us extending that out of the civilian population as time goes on and yeah. we, we fulfill this. But it's a reflection of the creativity and the innovation of our workforce and the fact that we've created an environment that says, I've got your back if things go badly. Right. Right. And so people are in vaccination. Uh, since the Sabin and Salk vaccines of the late 50s and early uh, 60s for polio, nobody's tried to vaccinate everybody in America. And even then it was mainly children that they were vaccinating. Right. Now we're trying to vaccinate everybody in America or yeah. most everybody in America. And uh, this has not been done in 100 years. And in that 100 years, uh, we're going to find out, and you'll see some stuff in the media that could go faster, you could do something different, but I couldn't be more proud of the VA and the creativity and innovation in the workplace that we've seen. Um, and uh, as I got my second shot this morning, I just sort of wandered around the process and they were talking about all the things they'd learned and how people were coming to look at the process from other healthcare uh, institutions around Washington, D.C., saying, well, we know the VA is doing really well. 
how do we replicate this? So really nice work, and, and morale is very, very high. Very high, very high. And, and you know, touching on morale and, and our employees, the employees that we have in the VA um, are used to being around those that volunteered to serve and maybe risk their lives and our veterans. But it's, it creates this uh, volunteerism um, in our system that it's probably unseen in many other systems. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about one of the things that you had said early on is, and you mentioned it today, is save every life that you can. And how did that kind of saying come about? But what, what, what were you trying to achieve or what were we telling this, the system to do or be able to do? So where did that come from uh, that came in an afternoon update where people were struggling with some of the bureaucracy and waiting for permission to do something. Um, it was a very similar situation to what um, I had seen in combat uh, when we'd had large numbers of casualties and we were hung up on who had authority to launch helicopters and um, we just bypassed the bureaucracy. And um, it, the second lesson that I learned uh, in my years, uh, I was getting ready to deploy uh, early in the Iraq War, and I was trying to get a combat hospital out, and I needed to get a combat hospital loaded um, from Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, down to Beaumont, Texas. And the, the people in the rail yard told me they couldn't get the train loaded. And it just seemed ludicrous to me that the, the complete participation and the send-off of the primary combat hospital that was going to follow the attack in that was coming out of uh, that portion of the war, uh, we'd have to delay the start of that combat because we couldn't get a train loaded. Um, we went out, uh, drove a Humvee across the railroad track, stopped a train, held the train until we'd get it loaded. <laughs> and um, it was a disrespect for um, the status quo. And the statement really of save every life you can is was really about don't wait for the bureaucracy to tell you it's okay to do what's right. That's right. Just do what's right and we'll have your back. Now it's not an excuse to do something nefarious, uh, but it is a chance to say that if our rules that we built for a non-pandemic environment don't work, then it's okay to be creative and innovative in order to save lives. The other place that that came from was we were hearing some of the um, uh, governors had asked for convention centers to be changed into uh, temporary hospitals. I found uh, most of those efforts really tough because these were very sick patients. And uh, it's tough in a convention center uh, without a stable infrastructure or supply system to run a critical care hospital. So they were taking very low intensity patients in those situations and, and frankly it hasn't worked very effectively and right. it was very expensive. Um, I wanted our system that is so good at taking care of very, very sick patients to take the sickest possible patients they could and they needed to reach out to hospitals that surrounded them and say, look, let, let us take the sickest patient off of you, the one that's going to use the most of your assets. Right. Let's take them uh, because we're really good at taking care we of are. sick people. Our hospitalists, our intensivists, our critical care nurses, our respiratory therapists, our surgical teams. I th this is a really good hospital system. I think it's the finest hospital system in the world, and we ought to be taking the sickest patients. So. This and I'm going. I know I'm going on way longer than <laughs> no, you want I think me this to. Was really but, good, um, John. All my life, I've been in organizations that had these sort of long vision statements, or or long uh, statements that gone on for a paragraph to try and be all inclusive. And it's important to be all inclusive. But um, what always connected me was really short vision statements. Right. And, and, and really the motto of what we've done for the last year is to try and save every life we could. And it's no different than what I had in the, in the military, in the Army. The, the, uh, the code for us was never leave a fallen comrade. Right. And that's how we acted in, in, right. in combat. We'd never leave anybody. 
and we would always work, and it worked for me. Uh, when I worked in the civilian sector, um, I worked for a Catholic health care system in one of my jobs, and our motto for a hundred years was we're providers of faith. Now, I, I wasn't Catholic, but it resonated with me. It made sense to me, and I think that the save every life you can uh, is something that resonated with me and hopefully with the rest of our, our uh, employees that have really fulfilled this mission so beautifully. Yeah, totally. And it's just, we're in awe of our employees and how, and how they continue to volunteer and what they do locally in their facilities and continuing to do. And we're almost a year into this pandemic. And I like to say with at least the vaccine, at least we're at the beginning of the end. Still don't know where the end's gonna be at, but we're at the beginning of the end. Yeah, uh, you know, I describe it as, um, John, uh, that we're in the last mile of the pandemic. But that mile may take a year to get yeah, through. Yeah. It depends on how quickly we immunize this population. It depends on the acceptance rate of the immunization. It depends on is the effectiveness of the immunization, what the research has shown at 95, 96%. Uh, all of that is part of this. But if we're ever going to get our lives back to where we were, um, it's going to take the acceptance of the vaccine uh, for us to get that last mile of this. And in the meantime, uh, we're going to continue to do a lot of health care and a lot of critical care work, as well as trying to make sure that veterans get in for their routine care. Um, I really do worry about the amount of people that have put off their yeah. colonoscopy, their mammogram, uh, their pap smear. I think those are the things that we have to get people in and assure people that we've got a safe environment. And therefore, just like the influenza vaccine, the vaccine for this pandemic should penetrate our population of employees to the point that we can assure them that when the patients come in, that they are safe. safe They're yeah. coming to a safe place. And um, it's the vaccine is voluntary, uh, but uh, it, it's pretty amazing the uh, amount of acceptance of the vaccine across the nation. Really high rates in excess of 80%. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned several things um, so far about, about leadership, and I mean, this is really what we're hoping to get at. What, what piece of advice have you ever received from a leader that stuck with you that you share or kind of maybe think about often or or share with other people? Yeah, uh, you, you talked in the beginning about the fact that I read. I've always read in advance of meetings. I've always felt I needed to be really prepared. Uh, I always operated under the concept that I probably wasn't as smart as most of the people that were sitting around me and I needed to do extra work to make sure that um, I was uh, I was well prepared. Um, Early on in my career, I sat on the board of one of the Catholic hospitals that I um, uh, worked at. And, uh, and in the board meetings, I won a lot of arguments. And then I realized after about six months that the organization never really moved. Uh, that I'd won the argument in the boardroom, the decision was made, but the organization didn't move. The organization didn't move, and this is, uh, somebody came to me and um, one of the guys that I'd served with in the military that um, had, was now working with me in that healthcare system, and he said, you haven't ever created followership. Yeah. He said, you never created anybody's desire to follow you. And he said, it doesn't matter if you win the argument. It doesn't matter if your idea was really great. It doesn't, none of that matters. What matters is that people are motivated to go in the same direction you want to go. About that time, and this will show you how long ago this was, uh, Gallup released a study that I've talked about a number of times, John, and um, this saying that whatever vision you have for the future, about 25% of uh, the organization will share your vision. 65% of people are good citizens, they'll follow the 25%. And about 10% of people are just going in a different direction. Your job as a leader is not to pay all your attention to the 10%. I, my, that's the job of the chief of staff. Exactly. <laughs> your job is to find the 25% of people that share your vision, to find the followers, and to grow the followers. And they are what will really move the organization. And th that's how we've led here. That's how we've made this 
behemoth of an organization, uh, you know, the second largest organization in the federal government, moved so beautifully through the Mission Act rollout and now the pandemic is really by creating followership and creating people who believe that it was their own idea that got this. I am never happier than when I can walk into a room, listen to a conversation, people are going in the direction that I think the organization go, and I don't have to say anything. Right. I don't have to say anything at all. The organization's moving, and that's what's happened here. I was out in, um, I think we were in Clarksburg, and um, we were wandering around the hospital, and um, the uh, nurse manager of the um, intensive care unit was talking about what was called a gimbal board, where her employees could come up and, and take an idea and on a sticky note, put it on the board, and they knew that within the next few days, the entire team was gonna discuss their idea. And she was talking about how this had awakened her employee group. And the employees were talking about the fact that they'd been there for a decade and it was the first time that their voice was really heard. That's deference to expertise. Yeah. That's high reliability. That's a learning organization. And that indicated to me that this organization is moving in the right direction at the most important level, and that is the level that faces the veteran that needs us for health care. And so the most important lesson is the person that stood in my office and said, you're not going to like what I'm going to say. It doesn't matter that you did your homework and that you won the argument. What matters is, do people want to follow you? Right. Well, and I think what you describe as well is <clears throat> creating the environment for those leaders to be able to, to make decisions as well as create the environment for employees to want to stand up and say something. I have an idea to improve this process or to ensure safety, et cetera. And you mentioned about uh, creating followers and followership. I'm a big believer in the first, in order to lead, you must first follow. And in order to do that, then you learn how to be a follower and then you can learn how to be a leader. Um, you had described, and you've described um, some of these leadership things. So if you were if an aspiring leader is watching this uh, and is uh, looking to att attain or achieve some leadership positions, what would you describe? What kind of things would advice would you offer to them? I mean, you've obviously given some great examples, but you know, kind of at that first leader level, what would you uh, maybe advise somebody to do? Recognize the fact that the most important thing you can do as a leader is listen. And... Uh, as you get your first position and you're leading four, five, ten people, listen to your people. And when you think you know the right answer, take a deep breath and listen for another half hour, an hour. <laughs> and spend some time learning from them. Learn from other people at your levels. Look at other people at your level of leadership. If you're a, a nurse manager or you're uh, the head of a maintenance team or an engineering team, uh, spend time looking at other engineering teams and say, and really decide what do you want to be like. Look, I, I'm not the same kind of leader you are. You and I agree on most everything, but the beauty is that we're stronger together than we are apart. Right. And um, we've got an environment where you're not afraid to speak up and say, you know, Rich, I think you're wrong. And I'm not afraid to say that to you. And then we have that sort of honest dialogue. But I think young leaders that are trying to decide sort of what they want to be need to grow up looking around and saying, what do they want to want to be like? How do they mimic? Um, I hate toxic environments. I hate uh, authoritarian environments that are that are toxic and you can just watch people sort of shrink down. It doesn't feel comfortable to me and you watch people sort of shrink away and you watch the intellectual capacity of a team be reduced when you're in that kind of environment. Uh, when I was uh, a colonel in the army I followed um, a leader who was incredibly toxic and people say well you know in the army people are in uniform they have to do what you tell them to do uh, no, they can ask for a transfer and vote with their feet. Well, the attrition in that unit was over 35%. And my job from my boss when I came in is stop the attrition. And it was wow. simply a matter of creating an environment where people wanted to be there and people were willing to join and uh, people willing to stay. 
and uh, we were able to drop the attrition really dramatically in the first year that I had that command. But um, it was in the same sort of message that that individual walked into my office when I was a young leader and had the chance to really argue at a governing board level. Um, but it, the most important lesson was create followership. Create followership. And then listen to the people who've done this That's a long right. time. You know, when I was a, a young officer in the Army, um, my dad looked at me and said, listen to your sergeants. They're done lots of work. And, and, and you know, John, from your career, the number of young lieutenants that you saw that <laughs> knew everything. That's right. And it's the, no different than July 1st when every new resident shows up in our training programs that think they somehow know something more than a 30-year nurse. Uh, they don't. They need to be quiet and listen. And, um, and th that's how you deliver really strong health care. That's how teams function at very high levels because it's never about the individual leader. It's always about the environment you create that allows people intellectual ca capacity to do this. You know, when I came uh, two and a half years ago, um, the governing board, uh, the network directors were meeting and had a chance the first day I was here to walk into the room and, and talk to them and uh, about sort of my vision for the future. Um, and, and that vision is to draw every bit of intellectual capacity out of all 364,000 people. Um, that's what success will be. That you, at the end of your career at the VA, will say, this was a place that I came to that every bit of talent I had, I left on the table and I was able to use it to make the organization better and to make care better for veterans. And, and that's really the vision for the future of this organization. And you know, we're gonna talk a lot about diversity and inclusion and how I believe, just like I did in the Army, that the support of the American people for the Army um, was by the Army looking like the American people. Right. Therefore, you needed diversity, you needed inclusion. It's the same here. Um, we must look like in our leaders, in our, our, uh, our employees, must look like the American veteran. And in order to do that, we have to really proactively work to change a lot of the things that have gone on. And so we have a new Office of Diversity and Inclusion that very reports that. directly yep. to Steve Lieberman, my deputy and I. And we're very proud of that. And um, you know, we're very anxious to get our training back balanced uh, where we really have honest dialogue and we talk to each other honestly. You know, I, I did a video this morning, John, uh, to our employees about some of the abhorrent uh, behavior and activities and horrendous uh, injuries and loss of life and destruction of property that happened in the people's house in this city. And um, I, I really believe that democracy should be noisy, but it should be peaceful. Yep. And um, I think that 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 sort of noise and honest dialogue, we shouldn't be afraid to talk to each other about things that are uncomfortable. And, and part of that is how diverse an organization we are, how inclusive we are. Are we actively working to uh, develop and promote leaders that look like our veterans? And only then will we have the support of the American veteran and the American people. It is not about bricks and mortar. It is really about our people. Right. And our people must be what we invest most in, and uh, how we develop them. Yeah, this is this is the what makes this organization so special to me is it's people helping people. It's all about people. There's no we don't build a widget at the end of the day. It's all about people helping people. And you can't, in my mind, you can't ask for a better position job or uh, to be in than than that. And you you've been in, so the EIC for 30 months. 31 months, yeah, I guess. 31 months. And, uh, and uh, there's been a lot going on in those 31 months. You mentioned Mission Act and obviously the pandemic. But today, what keeps you up at night? Uh, what, what worries you today that yeah. you're thinking about? Uh, this won't surprise you um, when I say it. It's really the sustainability of the organization through all of this stress. And uh, if, the, if, if the tail end of this, the last mile of this pandemic is another six months or year, uh, can the workforce sustain itself through that? And how do we 
how do we do that? And it, it's why people must know that they're not alone in this process. You know, there is, uh, there is some critical care nurse in an ICU that's going to show up for work or a respiratory therapist or a lab tech that's going to show up for work. Uh, they've got to know that they're not alone and that we're doing everything we can to continue to refresh the workforce and to make sure that they have time to take a breath and sustain themselves. Uh, so that's what keeps me up at night the most. Uh, secondly, um, in any transition, uh, we're about to go through the transition of, uh, of political leadership and it's a very exciting time. And I've been through multiple transitions in uniform and, and on the civilian side. Um, we, we must continue to develop the things that I've talked about in the time you and I have had together here uh, as, we've, uh, as we've prepared this presentation. Um, we must continue the course of development of the transition of the culture of the organization. We must continue to modernize. Uh, we must modernize our IT systems, uh, so our electronic medical records, our supply chain systems, our financial uh, methods must all be modernized. And it's not that I love that modernization of IT systems, but we got to take a hard look at the, at the processes we're doing and decide, do they really meet our needs uh, in now 2021 and in 2031 and 41? Uh, that's the future for us. Um, we. Also, the other thing that keeps me up at night is the aging infrastructure of our, uh, uh, of our facilities. Um, we need to recapitalize the organization. And when I say that, I really believe that in the future there will be a, a massive infrastructure bill uh, for the nation. I think the VA needs to be part of that. And I think as the VA needs to be part of that, how we recapitalize the organization will continue to support our great people and to make sure that our facilities are where we, the veteran is and where the veteran is uh, then we can serve them them better and um, you know we're seeing a tremendous movement of veterans from the northeast and the northwest into the southern parts of the United States but the people that are still in the northeast and northwest um, are often the most vulnerable portions of the population they can't afford to move they're, they're trapped in that area, and we need to be there to take care of them. Yeah. And uh, no veteran should believe that we're abandoning them. Now, this is a wonderful health care system. You know, one of my dearest friends has been ill with very critical um, uh, cancer problem. And some of his care was in the VA. Some of his care has been at one of our academic affiliates. His family called me and said, I can't believe the difference in care. It, in the academic affiliate, it was technically right, but they failed to understand the holistic nature of, of what we provide yeah. in the life of a veteran. And it is that holistic nature of caring for this entire family and recognizing this lifetime commitment that made them so comfortable when he moved back from the academic affiliate and is now an inpatient in uh, our VA hospital and you know the the doctor that picks up the phone at from home at night and says I know you can't visit your husband or your dad or your uncle and spends 20 minutes on the phone talking um, is extraordinary and you don't get that in the commercial space and it is exactly why uh, we are so good at what we do it is that holistic approach to health care and is what makes us different than any other healthcare system in the world. And the greatest healthcare system in the world, in my mind. Sir, we've come to the end of our time, and I am ecstatic for the sharing your stories and your leadership philosophy and, and having this dialogue. Um, I know that um, I've so much appreciated your leadership personally, and I know the employees as well. And so. Sir, just thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and, and uh, look forward to having further discussions about this uh, uh, in the future. So anything you want to close with, sir? Uh, John, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for allowing me to be here. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk, and I appreciate it. And thanks for your leadership. It's been an extraordinary partnership, and you've done just an amazing job as our chief. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. A huge thank you to all of you for listening, and a huge thank you to Dr. Stone for his time. 
Join us for our next episode where we get to chat with Monica Diaz, Executive Director of the VHA Homeless Program Office. See you next time.